Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we welcome all of you on behalf of Sri Lanka College of Endocrinologists uh, to this Meet the Experts in Endocrinology Forum. And the topic today we are going to discuss uh, is on osteoporosis. Um, myself is Dr. Dulani Kottahachi. I am a consultant endocrinologist at the Faculty of Medicine, uh, University of Kalania. With me, uh, I have Dr. Mauli uh, Arabavela. She's a senior lecturer and a consultant endocrinologist at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Sujaiwadhanapura. And also we have Professor Sachi Taberatna. He's a professor of his pharmacology and consultant endocrinologist at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. So we have around 60 participants for this forum now. So we are going to start the session. And to introduce the topic of osteoporosis, it's a disease which affects all women and men and of all races. And it is estimated that a woman above age 50 will acquire a fracture uh, around 50% of the women in their remaining lifetime, as well as men uh, in about 20% of them uh, during uh, their remaining lifetime. So this is osteoporosis is a risk factor for fracture as hypertension for stroke, as hyperlipidemia for uh, ischemic heart disease, this is a risk factor for fracture. So let's talk about osteoporosis. We hope to discuss about the uh, the physiology, how we diagnose osteoporosis, uh, the treatment thresholds, uh, how do we treat these osteoporotic patients, and how you should follow up your osteoporotic patients, because we think osteoporosis is an underdiagnosed and undertreated disease uh, at present, especially in Sri Lanka and around the world as well. So let me start with the case. A 71-year-old woman was referred for evaluation for osteoporosis to endocrine clinic uh, because she complained of back pain. Although back pain uh, is not a directly related uh, symptom uh, in relation to osteoporosis, it can occur with vertebral fractures, but this is one of the symptoms people have and they are referred for evaluation. So this particular patient uh, did not have any other comorbidities. Uh, yes, Dulani. So can you then uh, tell us, um, now in this patient, the 71-year-old lady who has been sent, referred uh, for evaluation of men, um, for osteoporosis, so what are the, um, what, are the, uh, what are the risk factors and how would you assess her clinically uh, and biochemically? Uh, first, let me introduce a bit about osteoporosis. What is osteoporosis? So osteoporosis is a metabolic uh, bone disorder. And as you can see in this uh, picture, you can see the disrupted bone on your right side. On your left side is the normal bone matrix. So in this, the main problem is the bone remodeling because in young adults, we form bones and it is matched by the bone resorption together. So bone formation and resorption are equivalent without any uh, damage, but with age, Sometimes with hormonal changes like postmenopausal and due to metabolic reasons like uh, corticoids, then you have a accelerated bone remodeling. And that can cause, you can see here, the bone plates are very thin and the connecting tissues are very thin, as well as less, less bone a matrix, which is so in, in a normal circumstances of a, a stress the bones will fracture uh, than a normal person in an osteoporotic bone. So let's we talk about the pathophysiology as well. You, can, you know that we have three types of bone cells, osteocytes, which form, sorry, osteoblasts, which form the bone, osteoclasts, which causes resorption, and the osteocytes, which are incorporated osteoblasts in the matrix. So bone cells forms bone, and then these clasts will resort. In the between, we have what is called rank ligands, which will help the osteoblasts to get converted to osteoclasts. So rank ligands are very important um, for a formation of osteoclasts and to uh, have their functions going on. So this balance is what is needed for the um, 
to have the re bone remodeling, but accelerated. Uh, this bone remodeling can occur, especially in the bone surfaces. That is why more trabecular bone is affected than the cortical bone, because trabecular bone has higher surface to mass ratio than the cortical bones. Because of that, we see more affected spine than the other cortical bones um, because of this reason. And when we need to evaluate the patient, we need to know about the risk factors. What are the risk factors for osteoporosis? There are major risk factors, like if you had a fracture in your lifetime, you have a higher risk of acquiring another fracture. And if you have a relative, first degree relative, uh, who have had a fragility fracture, yes, you are at high risk. Being Caucasian, Asian, postmenopausal woman is a risk factor with low body weight. If you are a smoker, and if you had oral corticosteroids for more than three months. So these are the major risk factors for osteoporosis. And there are conditions, medical conditions, which um, causes increased risk for osteoporosis, like COPD, Cushing's, if you have eating disorders, hyperparathyroidism, hyperphosphatasia, if you have uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, being a diabetic, paratoxic patients, stroke, especially multiple myeloma, vitamin D deficiency, liver diseases, all these medical conditions. If you have patients, you have to think, you have to treat these conditions accordingly, but then you have to think, oh, my, is my patient at risk of osteoporosis? We don't think of these factors when we treat, especially the elderly people. So there are some medications which are associated with reduced bone mass, such as anticonvulsants, leukocorticoids. If you have overtreated your patient with the high doses of thyroxine, we have seen many cases like that, especially for if they're treated for malignancy, you keep on treating them with very high doses. And if you are, your patient has had breast cancer on aromatase inhibitors, um, who are given medoxyprogesterone acetate, the Lipoprovera, uh, for contraception, they are at risk of developing low bone mass. So clinically, we need to evaluate these patients when we see a patient. So one of the important things is measuring height. I don't think very few of us do this. Uh, height measurement is very important. If your patient uh, has had a height loss of more than four centimeter, it signifies that the patient has had a more likely to have had a, a vertebral fracture. And you can also do the vertebral tenderness examination. You can uh, you can. Um, examine the vertebrae and give a small, um, from your wrist, you can uh, uh, give a small thumb on the vertebral and see whether the vertebrae are tender. So we can also detect vertebral fractures like that clinically. And symptoms and signs of other systemic diseases, we have to look especially for anemia and uh, looking for multiple myeloma, we have to look for anemia in these patients and the patient suspect thyrotoxicosis, you have to look for clinical features and especially for Cushing's like that, you have to keep on looking for the systemic diseases um, the, for the clinical evaluation. So how do we investigate these patients uh, for uh, osteoporosis, this, especially looking for secondary causes? On my left-hand side, I've written the most important test. You have to do a full blood count, look for anemia in this patient, and do ESR, uh, do an ESR so you can look for the clinical clues of um, uh, investigation clues for us to say when the patient has multiple myeloma, especially looking at the corrected calcium levels, phosphorus levels, real functions, very important, and also getting a vitamin D3 level uh, if you're suspecting high risk of osteoporosis. And there are some tests which we do only for selected patients, like if you suspect multiple myeloma, you have to do the multiple myeloma screen, including serum protein electrophoresis, the parathyroid hormone levels, if you find a patient with high calcium, if you think a patient is toxic or hypothyroid, then usually we do the TSH and the T4 in addition. And if you have a male patient and you think of hypogonadism, which they are at risk of low bone mass, you can do the total testosterone levels. And if you're suspecting celiac disease, then you can do the tissue transfer with uh, glutaminase antibodies. And biochemical bone markers are very important, but unfortunately they are not freely available for us uh, in Sri Lanka, which will help especially in uh, managing our patients, look at the, how they have uh, responded to treatment. So initial bone turnover markers will help us a lot. So let's, um, so I would like to ask uh, Dr. Mauli, 
Um, so what are so we've talked about uh, till now uh, what are the risk factors, how we evaluate a patient, and what are the investigations, and how we would diagnose osteoporosis in this patient. Yes. Um, so thank you, Dr. Durrani. Yes. Uh, so now, uh, after that clinical evaluation, um, let's move on uh, to a little bit about uh, talking about um, how do we diagnose osteoporosis. So the gold stand for diagnosing osteoporosis is by doing a bone mineral intensity. And that will uh, determine, uh, so the, the bone mineral density is measured by the amount of um, bone uh, mass uh, by area. And it is measured by uh, this DEXA scan. And you might have seen, uh, come across a DEXA machine. So this is the DEXA machine. And here you can see, um, let me get my point uh, option. Um, yeah, so here you get the uh, X-ray source and that which emits the radiation and you get the patient to lie down in the table and um, that the radiation then uh, will, um, uh, will apply its image on a multiple detector array where it is then uh, um, the report will be generated and then you will be given a report. So the DEXA scan is important in terms of diagnosing osteoporosis and also um, predicting fracture risk and also in monitoring. So let's see which sites we use to measure the bone mineral density. So these are usually axial sites. We can use the hip, the spine, and, um, and also the distal forearm. So usually at least two uh, sites need to be assessed. And usually it is always uh, the um, hip and the spine, but in certain instances where these cannot be used, for example, in someone who has a screw in the hip or maybe some undergone spinal surgery, then there can be interferences in the, in, in the inter, uh, interpretation. So in such situation, you would um, use the distal forearm. It is important to realize that we can't come into a uh, proper or accurate conclusion using peripheral sites. So, uh, you might have come across um, where people talk about, you know, using foot and um, maybe hand to detect osteoporosis, but unfortunately these are um, not recommended in diagnosing, in actually diagnosing osteoporosis. So it's also important to advise the patient uh, how to come prepared for a DEXA scan. So uh, we need to advise them not to wear any uh, underclothing with metal hooks, button zip and metallic um, paint or thread because these can interfere with the uh, with the scans and the uh, interpretation and also if certain people are wearing any body piercing in the areas of uh, you know being a region of interest such as maybe belly button so that can then uh, that metal uh, button can then um, come uh, in the way of proper interpretation patients who are on calcium should avoid calcium for about 24 hours uh, as it can get it can be still in the bubble and if the bubble super and the bubbles will superimpose in, in on the um, in front of the spine and then that can also cause problems in interpretation so it is also important to tell uh, ask them to make sure that they avoid radio contrast for two weeks and also it's extremely important to let uh, pre, i mean to exclude pregnancy uh, even though um, the excess can and just have it, uh, it uses x-rays, but the, um, the radiation is much less when you compare the chip, when, when you compare the standard x-rays. So it's around 120 a standard chest x-ray. Um, so, Maoli, uh, can you tell me in which patients would you consider doing a DEXA scan? Yes, um, so let's see in which patients require DEXA scanning. Uh, so according to the um, 2022 osteoporosis guideline, um, what they recommend is um, 
screening all women who are aged over 65 years or men over the age of 70 years and postmenopausal women and men between um, 50 to 69 years who have secondary risk factors. You, you know the risk factors now, uh, Dr. Dulan and I said, took us through it. So between that age group, if they do have secondary risk factors, they also warrant treatment. And adults over 50 years with any fragility fracture uh, also would require a DEXA scan. However, saying that it is not always possible to you know, um, screen patients like that uh, because uh, it depends on the availability and the accessibility to this DEXA scan. So in a resource poor setting as uh, in Sri Lanka, it might not always be possible. However, we need to keep in mind that these patients would require fracture assessment. DEXA is not recommended in children, adolescents, and healthy young men and premenopausal women uh, unless they have a significant uh, spe specific indication which puts them at risk of osteoporosis. So that is also very important that you do not do unnecessarily uh, unnecessary DEXA scans in these patient populations. So now let's move on to this patient's DEXA scan. So this is now our 71 year old lady was sent to us to evaluate for osteoporosis. So this is a DEXA scan. You can see uh, this is the report. So it is important to make sure that the uh, identification is correct um, so that you know that you're reading the correct scan. So the height, weight and the BMI is given. And now here this shows us the lumbar spine uh, and the lumbar spine, the region, the region of interest here is from L1 to L4. So these are the lumbar vertebra, which will be assessed. And it is important to make sure that the scan is uh, properly taken. Usually the vertebral spine should be in the middle of the image, uh, ensuring that there are adequate soft tissue on either side and the 12th rib and um, the anterior superior iliac spine, the tip should be barely visible. And then looking at the uh, report, now in this patient, of course, there's a little bit of scoliosis, right? So in looking at the report, now here you get the L1 to L4 vertebra and the area is shown as well as the bone mineral con uh, content, which is measured in grams. And then you get the bone mineral density and that is the amount of uh, bone mineral content per, content per square uh, centimeters. And those values are there. And it is also important to, in a normal person, the bone mineral density uh, from L1 to L4 will increase in a stepwise manner. And then we get the T-scores. So what are the T-scores? Now the T-scores compare, now this is our patient, is a 71-year-old lady. So the T-scores compare the, the 71-year-old woman's bone mineral density with the Caucasian young woman's bone mineral density, and it is given as a, a as a um, as how many standard deviations. So basically, if you take this lady's bone mineral density and you plot it in a normal in a um, normal distribution of a, a Caucasian young woman's bone mineral density, where does it stand? So how many standard deviations? Um, away from the mean, right? So here, now the T-score minus 3.6, you get the an, in L1 vertebra, L2 minus 2.8, and you can see L3 minus 2.2 and L4 minus two. So usually according, we know that usually the uh, cutoffs for osteoporosis is um, we consider if the T-score is less than minus 2.5, it is osteoporosis. If it's um, within minus one and minus 2.5, it is considered osteopenia. Now it is also known as low bone mass. And if it's, um, if it's more than minus one, then that is considered normal. So here uh, for the diagnosis of osteoporosis, uh, so here she, uh, sh the results show that she has evidence of osteoporosis. Now, what do the, uh, is it, uh, which is understandable because the T-scores always compare a patient, this patient to a young woman. Uh, now, the Z scores, what do they tell us? So the Z scores compare this woman's, this 71 year old woman's BMT with age matched same population. So here, um, now you can see the scores are there. So minus 1.1 uh, and so on. 
And the z score is significant if it's more or less than minus two. So that means there is an uh, additional secondary risk factor for the development of osteoporosis because you are comparing the say this woman with her own counterparts. So that is important. So here uh, the t score, the z scores are not less than minus two. So that means there is unlikely to be any significant secondary cause, and the likely cause for osteoporosis here is menopause. So again, now this is the other scan, other part of the scan in this patient, and this shows the um, hip, right? And here you can see, um, if I just, I'm trying to just to show these areas, this is the great trochanter troc and the uh, lesser trochanter, and then you get your um, neck box, and this is the Wads triangle, though it is a square, it's known as the Wads triangle. And um, looking at the reports here, so again, the same thing. Now here we, um, we get the, we need to focus here on the femoral neck and the total hip, right? So we do not take the other uh, scores like the wards or trochanter. We look at the femoral neck and the total hip. And you can see here that the T-score at the femoral neck is minus 2.4. And at the total hip, it's uh, giving a score of less, uh, minus 1.9. So this is just what we discussed. This is the T scores based on which you would classify a patient whether that patient has osteoporosis, osteopenia, or severe osteoporosis in the case where there's a minus 2.5 with a history of fracture. So coming back to our patient at the lumbar spine, she has a total T score of minus 2.7 and at the femoral neck, it's minus 2.4. Uh, however, so the, However, now, even though there are two different categories in these two uh, re region of interest, so, so the lumbar spine uh, fits in with osteoporosis, but the femoral neck is, is fitting in with the osteopenia. But however, when we consider, when we give a diagnosis, we have to consider the whole patient and we consider that patient has osteoporosis. So we do not uh, tell that there's osteoporosis in one place and osteopenia in the other place, but on whole, the patient has evidence of osteoporosis. And um, another important consideration, when would you consider further imaging of the vertebra? Uh, so if there's, um, if your patient has a loss of four less more than four centimeters in height. Dr. Dulani spoke about that as well. If the patient has kyphosis, so kyphosis usually occurs because could be there could be an underlying um, wedge fracture which is causing uh, kyphosis. And if the patient has been on long-term steroids, which is known to um, have a bigger toll on the spine. And if there is also um, DEXA, in the DEXA scan, if the uh, between in the DEXA scan of the vertebra, when we look at the uh, T scores from the um, from L1 to L4, in between any two of those vertebras, if there's a jump of more than one T score difference, then you need to be careful. There may be some underlying structural disease. So there could be maybe osteophytes or even a wedge fracture or maybe lytic lesion. So in such situations, you would want to uh, have a look in the vertebra. So in, in that case, you can either do an X-ray, which is the gold standard and which is being done here, I mean, because um, of the availability to look for any uh, wedge fractures or any other underlying issues. Uh, and vertebral fracture analysis uh, is also possible in the DEXA scan, but it needs a separate software. However, in Sri Lankan setting, uh, it is not being done. So these are the ways how you can have a better look at the vertebra to see if you are missing anything there, uh, such as a uh, wedge fracture. Okay, uh, so Maudi, I would like to ask a question from you. Now, are only patients with osteoporosis are at risk of fractures? What about uh, patients with osteopenia? Are they uh, at risk of fractures as well? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, yes, so um, it is also, this is a very important question. Now here, uh, the osteoporosis fracture rates and the bone mineral density distribution is shown. So in this, uh, in this chart, 
uh, you can see in the x-axis the bone mineral density T scores are shown. So obviously, like um, now osteoporosis means when the T score is uh, less than minus two point five. And um, so as as the T scores worsen, the bone mineral and the risk of fracture will also increase. So that is clear. So, but anyway, now. Now, but looking at the actual fracture rates or the actual fractures which happen in the population, when we look at that as well, take into consideration all these, uh, it is now the, the osteopenic, it was found that in the osteopenic range, there are a lot of fractures occurring, right? And so if we only consider uh, the patients with osteoporosis and take them and treat, we are missing out a lot on these uh, patients who have osteopenia. So therefore, to counteract that, the FRAX was developed. The FRAX tool, it's an assessment, it is a tool to, for us to, for us to help, helping us assess the fracture risk. So here, uh, anyone, one of you all can just, uh, go, uh, on the internet, you can check, um, you can search for FRAX uh, tool. And then uh, this is the link here, if you want. So in when you go to this link, so you, this is the home page. And this is uh, Professor Dr. John Kennis, who was instrumental in the development of this. And you can see here, you can choose for, so uh, thanks to Professor Lake um, uh, he has, he was instrumental in developing the Sri Lankan FRAX. So you can see down here, if you click on Asia, Sri Lanka is also there. So um, for our, our population, we can apply the FRAX. So how do you apply this, right? So you can, this is the web page that you will come when we use, uh, click on to Sri Lanka. And you have to put all this data, the patient's age, date of birth, gender, and all that, the weight uh, and the height. And then there are a lot of uh, risk factors which they ask whether the patient has, has had previous uh, fracture, uh, whether the parent had a fractured hip, current smoking, steroids, rheumatoid arthritis, any secondary cause of osteoporosis, whether the patient is taking alcohol, so on. So all these things you will need to click. And you can all you need to also put the femoral neck BMD um, of your DEXA scan report, and that um, here. So I have put a um, put the score for our patient uh, the uh, femoral neck BMD. But FRAX can also be ca calculated even without putting the BMD. However, FRAX is not uh, foolproof. Um, so when you put all these uh, things into the FRAX, it will generate a result. Now here you can see the um, result. Now with the BMD, the major osteoporotic fracture risk is 8.9 and the hip fracture risk is 3.7 fracture in the hip, the spine, um, or even uh, or the humerus or in the wrist. So the risk of this patient developing a, such a fracture over the next 10 years is 8.9 and the hip fracture is uh, 3.4. Uh, issues in the FRAX is that now it doesn't take into consideration the risk of falls. Say a patient, we know that um, with a fall will break bones. So the um, assessment of the frailty or the risk of falls is not being assessed. And also, now here you can see the glucocorticoids. So the glucocorticoids also, if we, if someone is on a high dose of glucocorticoids, as opposed to a very low dose of glucocorticoids, the person on a higher dose is at higher risk of developing fracture, but this is not uh, accountable here. So there are certain issues. And also when there's a um, discrepancy between the spine and the hip, because here in the it asks for the femoral neck BMD. And for someone who has a, a adequate femoral neck BMD, but if the spine is very uh, low in BMD, that is not also taken into consideration. So, and also various other secondary causes um, also are not taken into consideration. Someone might have had several fractures then there are definitely, I mean, at higher risk. So there are uh, various caveats in the uh, FRAX that you need to keep in mind. So the important question comes down to as to who, who to treat. So this will depend, this kind of ha, um, differs across countries. So in the US, there are guidelines such as the 2022 um, osteoporosis, bone health and osteoporosis foundation guidelines on osteoporosis. Their recommendation is 
that postmenopausal women and men over the age of 50 years with the vertebral or hip fracture, regardless of T score. So, if someone over the age of 50 years has a fracture in these areas, uh, regardless of the scanning, you can go ahead and treat. If someone develops a fracture in the pelvis, the humerus, um, the distal forearm with low bone, uh, low bone mass or osteopenia, that is also an indication to treat. If the T-score value is less than 2.5, minus 2.5, index a scan, uh, that is also an indication. However, um, if a patient's scan shows that there is evidence of osteopenia, then we can go ahead to calculate the FRAX. And if the FRAX is, uh, the major osteoporosis fracture uh, risk is more than 20%, or the hip fracture risk is more than 3%, then that is also, uh, these patients can be treated. So the, the interventional thresholds for which have been recommended in these guidelines based on the US uh, is, uh, is to treat. So these are these uh, FRAX dependent, uh, uh, the interventional thresholds dependent on the FRAX is by, a, uh, you know, it, it will differ from country to country because it is based on uh, cost-effective, cost-benefit uh, analysis because, you know, osteoporosis is a, a disease which requires long-term treatment and the treatment is expensive and it needs long-term treatment. And then you have to think that uh, is that cost-effective as opposed to uh, preventing a fracture. So the, in the UK, however, the stance is a little different and, um, the, different, and they have this um, National Osteoporosis Guideline Group guidance, the DOG guidance. So this is also available in the uh, FRAX itself. So in the UK, this is based for UK population. If you uh, put the FRAX and then you put the BMD uh, up in the DEXA scan, then they, they will generate interventional thresholds. So that means for the major osteoporotic fracture and the hip fracture, they will give inter. So your patient will be shown as to where that patient falls. The green area is the low risk, the slightly the red color is high risk, and this area is very high risk. So if your patient falls in the green area, then only lifestyle recommendations are what you need to focus on. But uh, in the red area, uh, you need to consider you need to start them on treatment. The NOC guidance also can be used for patients without the BMD. So say a patient comes and you want to assess this patient's risk of fracture. So even without doing a DEXA scan, you can still put those um, criteria uh, and then see. And this will then cal be calculated. So this is what it looks like. And depending on that, so if the patient falls into the green area, you don't need to uh, do anything, but just focus on lifestyle. However, if the patient falls in the amber area, the patient will require, re require BMD scan. And if the patient falls in the red area, that means the patient needs treatment and will also require a base scan for baseline assessment. So what about Sri Lanka? Now the Sri Lankan uh, FRAX, um, you we know we discussed about the Sri Lankan FRAX. So in the FRAX, the interventional threshold. So uh, when you put the FRAX, you get a uh, risk of major osteoporotic fracture and hip fracture. So the interventional thresholds have been um, found, have been have been known, have been specified by some of the research done by Professor Sarat Lake Amerson, which I have shown here. And uh, out of these, uh, roughly we can consider that for major osteoporotic fracture risk reduction, uh, fracture risk of more than 10% and hip fracture more than 3% uh, can be, you can consider uh, treatment. However, uh, some recent studies, uh, he has also discussed about um, uh, taking the age into consideration and for older people, a little bit of a different cutoff and younger people, a, a different cutoff, uh, because uh, actually this, when you consider talk about the fracture risks, the fracture risk will increase as age goes on. So the interventional thresholds will differ. It is not actually accurate to use the same in interventional threshold for a, for a 50 year old as opposed to an 80 year old. So therefore there are certain differences. Uh, however, for the time being, I think it would be okay for us to go uh, stick to these cutoffs. So there are various guidelines, many guidelines and uh, FRAX and interventional thresholds, 
but however, it can be sometimes a little confusing, but some, but most important thing is your clinical judgment and you need to think about the patient who is sitting in front of you. So we are talking about a 71 year old frail lady with osteoporosis uh, with a spine T score of minus 2.7 and femoral neck T score of minus 2.4. So based on this, uh, I think that this patient would warrant treatment. So, um, so Dr. Sachet, uh, can you tell us how would you uh, consider a treatment in this patient? What are the treatment uh, options available for this patient? Uh, yes, Mauli. Now, as you correctly said, uh, these patients need treatment. Now, before we go into treatment, uh, we'll quickly see what are the goals of our treatment. Now, any patient uh, who we are treating for osteoporosis, we would like uh, to have their bone mineral density increase. So that is uh, not only enough, we would also like to see that their fracture risk uh, should come down. So by way of increasing BMD, that is what we expect. And when we try to select treatment, we would like to see from clinical trial data whether they, whether they do actually increase BMD as well as they do reduce the fracture risk as well. So uh, by treating, we would like to improve their quality of life. So therefore, we have to look for the side effects of these treatment as well. Now, unfortunately, none of the treatment available at this time do not uh, change the microarchitecture of the bone but they do increase bone mineral density as well as they do reduce the fracture risk. Now, uh, before going into pharmacological therapy, we uh, usually start with the non-pharmacological therapy. So it is very important that uh, we counsel the patient about the risk of uh, fractures because this is a long-term disease and they need to understand this. And when they understand this, their compliance or their adherence to the medicines will be better. And they should take adequate intake of calories because malnutrition is known to uh, cause loss of bone density. And then they should consume a diet, uh, a balanced diet, and there should be uh, adequate intake of calcium. Uh, the general recommendation for calcium is about 1,200 milligrams per day. Uh, and uh, I know that there are a lot of controversies about taking calcium because uh, some people think there may be a little bit of extra cardiovascular risk when you take calcium. So according to the evidence available, uh, if you take doses lower than or close to 1,200 milligrams per day, the risk of these cardiovascular events are very low. So the whatever the trials, few trials, which have shown some cardiovascular issues, all those have happened when high doses of calcium, more than 200 milligrams, uh, have been taken. And the other thing is we generally encourage them to take uh, most of their calcium through diet. Uh, and when that is not enough, we try to supplement maybe 500 milligrams per day. Uh, and if their diet is really deficient, you can give uh, 1000 milligrams per day of calcium for these patients. And at the same time, uh, replacing vitamin D, uh, generally for most of these patients, we give 1000 to 2000 international units of vitamin D. But if they have low levels of vitamin D, you have to give higher doses than this. But be careful not to give supraphysiological doses of vitamin D, because sometimes when you give calcium and high doses of vitamin D, that can lead into hypercalcemia, lead into uh, renal stones and other problems. And then it is very important that they do some regular weight bearing exercises. And uh, walking would be a good exercise. And then we do of muscle strengthening exercises and uh, balance training exercises also are important because they reduce the falls in these patients. And then whatever you can do uh, to modify their home setup to prevent falls will also be uh, very important when treating these patients.
And then we generally discourage some of the exercises, particularly the ones uh, which they do extreme bending and put a lot of strain into their backs because if they have severe osteoporosis, even this kind of exercises can lead to fractures. Now, when we come talk about therapy, there are two major categories of therapies. One is anti-resorptive therapy, other one is anabolic therapy. Now, what is commonly available to us is this anti-resorptive category, and I'm sure you all know about the bisphosphonase, that's a commonly used category in this uh, group, and then other very effective medicine is denosumab. And then these uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators like raloxifene, calcitonin, estrogens, uh, they also have shown some benefit in treating some patients, but because of this limited side effects, their use is limited. And then uh, recent times, a lot of interest has been uh, drawn to this anabolic therapy because they actually have the potential to build bone on top of uh, stopping the bone uh, resorption. And therefore, they have shown to uh, increase the bone mineral density much more than these anti-resorptive agents. And there are a uh, few categories, teribatide, this is a parathyroid hormone-like uh, medicine, as well as we have the parathyroid hormone-related peptide analog, which is called apolopatide, and a new drug, which has uh, a very interesting mechanism of action, which is called romazuzumab. It's mainly an anabolic medicine as well. Now, when we look at the efficacy of these medicines in terms of fracture reduction, as you can see from this graph, uh, most of the uh, bisphosphonate we use, alendronate, isidronate, and so on, acid, they have shown efficacy in reducing vertebral fractures, non-vertebral fractures, as well as the hip fractures. So is denosumab and teripatide also mostly have shown vertebral fracture and non-vertebral fracture reduction, but some of the later studies have shown they also reduce hip fractures as well. And the other treatment like calcitonin and raloxifene I mentioned, they are mainly the efficacy is limited to the vertebral fracture reduction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sachi. So can you tell us uh, how would you select what is best for our patient? Uh, yes, Mauli. Now, uh, so we discuss about different treatment options which are available. Uh, now, when, when, when we come to selecting a particular drug or particularly, let's say about this patient, we have to consider what is available to us and the cost of these medicines as well as the efficacy. Now I showed you that bisphosphonates are effective group of therapy. They reduce vertebral, non-vertebral as well as hip fractures. And uh, their mechanism is that uh, they, once we uh, take the drug, they go and deposit in these bones. And there they inhibit the action of osteoclasts which erode the bones and thereby by inhibiting them, they promote bone formation, thereby increase the BMD and later reduce the fracture risk. So even after stopping, that is one advantage bisphosphonates have. So even we uh, stop it, the action will continue for some more time because they go and deposit in the bones. Now in this slide, you can see uh, most of the bisphosphonate we use, they have shown uh, very good uh, fracture reduction rates, both vertebral and hip fractures. And out of them, uh, the alendronate and uh, sohydronic acid seems to be the uh, most effective groups of therapies in this class. Now, when you take bisphosphonate, there are important things you need to uh, remember, particularly uh, uh, the oral bisphosphonates. Uh, and before giving them, you have to make sure that patients do not have any uh, esophageal problems like achalasia or esophageal strictures, or uh, they should be able to remain upright after taking the medicine. Uh, because the way, uh, the correct way of taking uh, bisphosphonates, oral bisphosphonate would be, you have to take it empty stomach as soon as patient gets up. That is because uh, these medicines anyway would have very low bioavailability. And if someone takes it along with the food, they will not get absorbed. And the other thing is, 
they should be taken with a large glass of water that is to prevent dislodging the medicine in its fissures therefore it could cause erosions and then after taking the medicines patients should remain upright that is they can be either sitting or standing but not to lie down at least for half an hour um if a patient is taking the monthly bendrone tablet then they have to uh, wait at least one hour so while on a weekly tablet they can wait about 30 minutes without lying down uh and if the injectable preparation that is iv sorbitalic acid is given uh, that usually needs to be diluted in uh, 0.9% saline about 100 ml of saline and has to be given uh, over a roughly about 30 minutes period because if you give it it at a fast pace that can lead into more acute phase reaction that is uh, flu like illness uh, when these medicines are given and then the other important question is how long do we have to treat now uh, the fit trial which uh, showed the efficacy of alendronate showed that 5 years of treatment there's a very good response and they extend this trial called uh, the flex trial up to 10 years so one group got only 5 years and then a placebo the other group got alendronate for 10 years so as you can see in this uh, diagram uh, the group which got 10 years of treatment had uh the better results than the ones who got the 5 years so similar data has been shown with the iv sorbitalic acid where the usual period is 3 years but the extension trial has shown that 6 years of therapy is better in terms of fracture reduction now the concern there would be whether they cause uh, extra side effects but most of the time uh, it seems uh, there won't be Uh, too much of side effects, and in many patients, particularly if they are at high risk, sometimes treating beyond the period of five years up to the uh, period of ten years would be safe. So, if it is a patient who is on alendronate, if it's high risk after five years, if still the fracture risk is high, you can consider going up to ten years. And if you have given sorbitalic acid for three years and still the fracture risk is high then you can consider going up to 6 years with those medicines right thank you so um dr sajid can you tell us uh, about what are the side effects um, in using this um, long term medication uh yes maudi now uh, that is something uh, most uh, people and uh, most doctors as well as most of the patients are uh, afraid of the side effects of bisphosphonate uh so i'll start with uh, the uh, common ones and then go to more rare but some important ones now uh, if alendronate is taken uh, it could cause esophageal irritation so therefore it's important that we need to exclude uh the patient doesn't have any esophageal problems before taking the medicines but if they later develop that we might have to think of shifting into a intravenous preparation and when we give the intravenous sorbitalic acid those preparations can cause acute phase response that is like a flu like illness and all these medicines can cause hypocalcemia and particularly the intravenous form so it is very important that before giving uh intravenous medicines we have to correct their calcium and vitamin d levels and then musculoskeletal pains uh, could also result in but the two most feared side effects of bisphosphonate would be this osteonecrosis of the jaw and the atypical femur fracture now this osteonecrosis of the jaw as you can see in this picture when there is dental major dental uh, manipulation like tooth extraction is done the uh, exposed bone will not heal over time if the patients are on bisphosphonate but however this complication was mainly seen in cancer patients who has been given uh, high doses of uh, bisphosphonates intravenous bisphosphonate at a more frequent period than what we treat in uh, osteoporosis so most of the time we don't see this complication that much in uh, when treating osteoporotic patients the other complication is this atypical femur fractures again the inc uh, incidence is rare but uh, it will depend on different studies they have done 
but this is serious side effect uh, as you can see here they will get a, a horizontal fractures of the femur this is uh, thought to be because of the adynamic nature of the bones which is induced by the bisphosphonates long term use again this is a very rare thing and uh, i would also like to show this study to you just to give uh, put the uh, things uh, in a more clear way now here what they have done is they have looked the uh, the uh, spine fractures as well as fracture reductions for number of 100000 patient years that is like say 10000 patient treated for 10 years that comes about 100000 patient years so here you can clearly see uh, in this category the studies they have done uh, the fracture risk uh, let's say final fractures about uh, 4500 and when you use bisphosphonates that significantly lower the fracture risk uh, as the risk factors as well as hip fractures they significantly lower the fracture risk but if you see this osteonecrosis of the jaw it's very very uh, small amount uh, and uh, atypical femur fractures again you can see the uh, last two boxes the red color box is bisphosphonate treated for 5 years and the blue color box is bisphosphonate for 10 years so 5 years treatment number of atypical fractures is very small but when you treat for 10 years that number increase but still then you can see if you compare with the number of fracture reductions uh, the amount of atypical femur fractures are very low okay uh, right so i think uh, we have discussed about uh, the bisphosphonates um and uh, now uh, i would like to uh, ask mauli now we uh, would like to uh, select uh, bisphosphonate like alendronate for this patient how would we uh, follow up this patients if we start patient on bisphosphonate yes um <clears throat> so this lady uh, the 71 year old lady has been um, started on alendronate so you have given all the instruction how the drug should be administered so how should we then proceed so it is um, always good practice to get them to review them in about 2 um, to 3 months and see how they are doing with the drug because uh, to see whether there is any gastric irritation is the patient uh, taking the drug is she compliant has she developed any side effects and so on so if she is tolerating and also to re uh, reemphasize on uh, the need for importance of compliance um, so after that if everything is fine then you can reassess uh, Uh, ask the patient to come back in one year, and then again see if the uh, clinical situation is still the same. Meaning whether there is any development of new risk factors, new illnesses, whether she has developed any fractures in between, and so on. So usually, um, follow up to see whether the patient has responded to treatment or not is usually. I mean, we can do uh, repeat scanning, digital imaging, and the interval is usually maybe. A, is usually about 2 years but however this is again uh, dependent on the risk factors of your patient so it, you have to make a individualized uh, decision when you are going to reevaluate so if the patient is a high risk patient uh, then she would warrant uh, even more frequent scanning however if she develops a fracture at any point then of course you need to reassess this patient Uh, however if things are going smoothly the patient is tolerate in the medication and she is um, there are no other uh, fractures or no other uh, change in the risk factors then you may even consider um, reevaluating after 5 years so in this patient here um, now she comes uh, she she's had a rescan done in 5 years so in between economic crisis set in and um, therefore the establishment could not afford the uh, uh, color prints so therefore she has a um, black and white scan unfortunately so let's look at how to interpret the changes 
It is also good practice to see the height. Anyway, for the DEXA scan, they, um, the height is measured. So initially 158 centimeters five years back, and now the um, height is 157 centimeters. And this is because to see whether there is you know, uh, more than four centimeter um, loss in the height, because that would indicate that you, know, you should look for evidence of um, possible silent vertebral fractures. You need to remember vertebral fractures can occur without pain so it can be silent so you know you do um, exclude these things so looking at the bmt so here the results are shown in the dexa scan and um, uh, in now this is a repeat scan and it is also important to do the repeat scan from the same uh, machine the patient underwent evaluation in the previous time because then they can give us a summary so here, this uh, lady underwent the scan in the same uh, in the same machine. So in 2018, you can see the BMD of the spine was 0.697, and now she has a, a scan of point, uh, the BMD value of 0 0.712. So there is a slight improvement. So you compare the BMD scores and not the T scores. It's important to uh, realize that. And there's this um, fracture, uh, the percentage fracture. Um, risk change. So this is calculated by looking at the baseline and the current um, BMD values and, and what is the percentage change. So if you consider here, now there is the change is 2.1. So this is the fraction is given on the baseline value. So plus 2.1. So that means there has been a uh, slight increase in the BMD. But then again, uh, so let's look at the repeat uh, scan in the hip. And here again, now, now you can look, see here, in 2018 in the left hip, it was 0 0.627. And in the latest one, there's 0 0.567. So that means there has been a reduction. Again, you compare the BMD values. So there has been a change and there, it has been a negative change. So this is neg minus 9.6. This is the um, change in the BMD, so it has reduced. So how do you know whether this is significant or not? Bear in mind, like if, if one person gets into a DEXA machine and gets this fracture analysis done, um, and then gets down again and gets into the machine again at the same point, still there can be a, a change between the, the two reports. That is because of various changes in the positioning and in the machine. So you have to give allowance for that. You have to bear in mind that we have to make an important clinical decision on whether this patient you know, is going to be on the same treatment, change in treatment or so on. So th that is where the least significant change comes. So the least significant change uh, is like when, you know, now we calculated the percentage change in the BMD. So uh, least significant change means what is the, difference in this percentage, uh, in this change, which is given as a percentage about which we can say with 95% confidence that this is a true change and not a, you know, change in due to the machine or due to the position. So these have been calculated uh, to this, the, this will depend on the machine also. And uh, these can be roughly, if you consider the lumbar spine is 5.3, total hip five and femoral neck 6.9. So now in our patient, there was a change in the spine, uh, in the femoral neck, the percentage change in BMD was minus 9.6. So you can see that it is below the least significant change. So that, that means she has lost bone mass there. And it is, we can say that it is significant. And in the spine, she had, uh, sorry, this is, it, it is a change that there was an improvement in the bone mineral density. So it was 2.1, but this is not very significant because for it to be a significant uh, change, it has to be more than 5.3. So however, all in all, there has been a reduction in the bone mineral density. So we can say that our goals have not been achieved here. And it is, we can consider this as a treatment failure. So Sachit, um, can you tell how would you set about now managing her? What are the options for her? Uh, yes, Mauli, thank you. 
Now, uh, when we uh, see a patient like this who has been given uh, five years of alendronate, but uh, when you do the DEXA scan, there's a decline in BMD. So what we generally expect is we would expect uh, the BMD to increase by this time, or at least it should be stable. But if you see declining BMD, then there is some issue. So then you have to carefully see what are the reasons. So first thing we will ask is whether the patient has been compliant or adhering to the treatment well. So if that is uh, okay, the next things we have to see is whether there is a problem in uh, absorption of these medicines, because I told you that uh, they have a very poor bioavailability. So we have to take all the precautions to get them absorbed well, but even then some patients may not have proper absorption. So in such a situation, we have seen that if we change to a, a, a IV bisphosphonate like sohydronic acid, then uh, these patients, some of these patients have a better response. Now, I told you that uh, if the risk is high, even after five years, you have to consider extending the period of treatment. So in this patient, I would say uh, starting a, uh, something like IV uh, sohydronic acid would be a uh, better option. You can give it for one year and reassess and then decide how long you need to treat. And then I need to say that there are other options as well. Uh, so. However, these medicines I'm going to tell you now are of limited supply in, in our setup, but they are very good and they have shown very good efficacy as well. Now, denosumab is a medication uh, which is again anti resorptive therapy. Its mechanism is that uh, the osteoblasts, they secrete a, a molecule called rank ligand, which goes and binds to the osteoclast and they cause bone erosion. Now, denosumab is a monoclonal antibody against the rank ligand, which inhibits the rank ligand, and therefore it doesn't uh, activate the osteoclast and therefore improve the bone density. Uh, so they have shown excellent results. They reduce spinal fracture 68%, hip fractures 40%, uh, non vertebral fractures by 20%. So good results have been shown. Uh, they are given a subcutaneous injection every six months, no dose adjustment needed in uh, kidney impairment. So that's a plus point where bisphosphonate we can't use uh, uh, if the kidney impairment is there. Uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw, atypical femur fractures and hypocalcemias have been reported, but lesser frequency than with bisphosphonate. However, the concerning problem with this denosumab is that once you stop treatment, uh, within about six to 12 months period, there's a significant decline in BMD. So if you use denosumab, then you have, should have a plan. After that, you should uh, replace that with another agent like bisphosphonate, which stays in the bone and prevent this bone loss. And then teriparatide has been in use for a long time now. It's a recombinant human PTH. Uh, it's anabolic agents, again, given as subcutaneous injection, daily uh, injection. It's reduced fracture risk and non vertebral fracture risk, uh, impressive uh, values. And uh, this is generally indicated uh, in patients with high risk of fractures or in patients sometimes who fracture while on other uh, uh, osteoporosis treatment. Uh, treatment duration is about two years because that's the time where they have safety data on these medicines. And you should not give them in hypercalcemic patients or hypercalcuric patients. And uh, if there's any suspicion of osteosarcoma and any risk of osteosarcomas, like patients who had irradiation to their bones, uh, then these agents should not be given. So there's another agent called uh, aboloparatide, which is the parathyroid uh, related peptide analog, uh, which has shown similar efficacy uh, as to teriparatide. And then the new or newest treatment which has been approved for osteoporosis is this uh, called romazuzumab, and it is a sclerostein inhibitor. Now, if I tell you what is sclerostein, sclerostein is a uh, molecule which inhibits the osteoblastic function, so it uh, reduces bone formation. At the same time, it promotes osteoplastic action, so it, it causes the bone erosion as well. Now, uh, this uh, came into light because they noticed this uh, genetic condition called sclerosteosis, where those patients had uh, thick bones due to excess formation, due to inhibition of sclerosteine. So based on that, they designed this molecule romazuzumab. It's a monoclonal antibody against sclerosteine. That is the first agent which has dual mode of action, which increased bone formation at the same time, decreased the bone resorption. So now it's FDA approved for treatment of postmenopausal osteoporosis. 
And I think it, uh, this is the agent which has shown the most impressive results out of any agent available to treat osteoporosis. So they have shown to reduce new vertebral fractures by 73% of one year's treatment. And when they compare it with, with alendronate, where they gave romosismab one year, followed by alendronate one year, versus alendronate for two years, there was a 50% uh, extra fracture reduction with the romosismab group. But in one trial, they noticed that there are excess cardiovascular risk, uh, cardiovascular deaths, heart attacks, and strokes. Therefore, it should not be given in high risk patient of cardiovascular disease. Right, so uh, I think uh, we have discussed a uh, lot of important aspects regarding osteoporosis in uh, today's webinar. And now I would like to uh, invite Dulani uh, to summarize and give us some important uh, key points. Uh, I thank all the two speakers for a wonderful uh, session on osteoporosis. I think we've uh, learned a lot uh, on how we can uh, manage these patients. So to sum up, osteoporosis is a preventable metabolic disease. And if you even had a fracture, it is treatable a disease. And like I said, like hypertension, like dyslipidemia, we have to think of uh, treating these patients uh, to avoid a uh, fracture because having a fracture increases your risk of mortality uh, and increase your risk of morbidity as well. So we've discussed about how we can assess uh, uh, osteoporotic patient by, by looking at the risk factors, how we can clinically evaluate these patients, and especially by doing a DEXA scan, how we can diagnose and also risk uh, assessments, very important, especially in osteopenic patients where the factor risk is very high. If you don't do the proper risk assessment, there will be uh, fractures for them, uh, which should have been avoided. And uh, proper treatment, according to the patient's uh, needs. And if you select the patients correctly, bisphosphonate would be the uh, first line of treatment. Oral and IV both are available. And when we assess these patients, it's very important, the compliance. We've seen a lot of patients started on this treatment and just continuing this treatment without proper advices. Sometimes they can discontinue early. Sometimes they take it for longer than necessary. So we have to assess these patients by following them up, by doing DEXA scans. Um, two to five yearly is the recommended duration, but you can do it earlier if your patient is at risk. But if you think your patient has um, not um, been treated uh, to uh, reach the goals we uh, need, to achieve the least significant change in bone mineral density, then we have to think of the second line options, which are very expensive at, um, to a local setup, but we do need to consider them um, when uh, necessary uh, to re uh, reduce their fracture risk. And follow them up uh, very closely in your clinic. So this is lifetime disease, it's just going to go away. We have to continue to follow these patients up and assess their uh, fracture risks. So I think one of the most important things for the patient education is the prevention of falls. We have to give them proper advices, especially the elderly people, uh, how they should avoid falls. So, um, so we have uh, come to the end of the osteoporosis session. May I also thank the two speakers for wonderful uh, contribution uh, to making this uh, osteoporosis symposium, um, the event uh, successful. And as um, uh, we are uh, heading to the month of, month of March, I would like to invite uh, all of you to Obesity Today, which is going to be held on the 3rd October at the SLMA. Uh, you need prior registration for this. There's only 200 limited seats uh, at SLMA. So uh, please register for this event, which will be conducted by a consultant nutritionist, uh, consultants in sports medicine, uh, consultants, uh, some psychiatrists looking at psychological aspects, and talking about pharmacotherapy. And finally, there'll be a, a discussion panel uh, considering all the novel concepts uh, in obesity. So I would like to invite all of you to join us for this Obesity Day um, event on 3rd of, October, 3rd of March at uh, SLMA. Thank you all for, and we have, I think we have answered a lot of questions uh, given on the chat box. Um, you answered them all, I suppose. So thank you all for joining. Have a nice day.